Well, hello and welcome to the Meaning Project podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Daniel A. Franz. And as always, thank you for this opportunity to bring a little bit of mental health and meaning to your day. Uh, and today, wow, what an awesome opportunity to bring some mental health and meaning and purpose with me today. It's Mr. Mark Delaney. Mark is out there sharing the good message of purpose. And Mark, I'm, I'm curious. I just want to get right into it. I mean, I'm big into, you know, my, my kind of tagline is meaning, purpose, and resilience, and you're right in the middle there. What what brought you to this kind of work, helping people find their purpose? You know, it, it just something, it's something that came out of my life. It was never my plan. It, it just came out of my life. I was a teacher for many years, usually 14-year-olds. The longer I taught 14-year-olds, I realized maybe we're all about 14-year-olds, <laughs> As I sometimes caught myself teaching them, and I'm like, am I talking to myself? Uh, and why aren't my friends in this room with this this conversation we're having? So just teaching 14-year-olds for so long, and my goal was always, uh, how do I help kids for a lifetime? I mean, if we're going to be in this room, and we're going to be doing something, it needs to impact their real life. It can't just be some kind of just educational stuff we're supposed to do. I want something that's actually going to impact them. And so looking at the, looking at the at human beings, hundreds a year for about 20 years, what really do they need to know? What really do they need? And I just can't, I just looking at life, my own life and people, I don't know how anyone exists without a clear, powerful sense of their purpose. And I, I was talking to a school administrator a while back at a restaurant, and I asked him, what are you doing to help your students with their sense of purpose? And he didn't really have an answer. I don't, I don't think he really cared to try to answer. I, and I said to him, I said, if you look around this restaurant, every single thing in this restaurant makes sense because you know what everything in this room is for. When your eyes see anything in this room, you immediately know what it's for, so it all makes sense. So the problem is, when people look in the mirror, they don't know what they are for. Yeah. I think and that's how such do a you... strong statement. Yeah, go ahead, yeah. sorry. And how do you live boldly if you don't simply know what you are for? Well, and I think... Uh, that that is a key word there. How do you live boldly? And, and I think we live in a time where not everybody is truly living boldly because they don't know their purpose. We just put one foot in front of the other every day and I call it a life. And before you know it, we're looking back. Uh, you know, we talk often uh, about uh, the midlife crisis, the crisis of of getting to that point and not realize and realizing like. What have I done? Where am I going? And now yeah. I'm curious, what an amazing statistic. I love the way you said that. 20 years, 100 people a day. I mean, you touched a lot of lives. You had a lot of impact. And I'm sure they impacted you. What did you come to to find that that those 14-year-olds and, and the rest of us need to find that purpose? How do we get there? I, I Well... As I look at life, I think there's only three things that matter. For me, the words are purpose, freedom, and love. There, there, everything else is extracurricular. It can come and go. But if I wake up every day with a sense of purpose, the freedom to live it out, and I experience great love with the people in my life, to me, there is nothing else. So looking at purpose um, from the youngest of ages, even to the oldest of ages, um, I think it's actually quite simple. I think the problem is we get too smart and we complicate it. And in the complication, I think we constipate our very lives. I was talking about purpose. I love to talk about purpose with people who are 55, but I also love talking about purpose with people that are very young. Probably the youngest people I talked to about purpose was a five-year-old and a three-year-old. They were family friends, and I found myself sitting at their table for uh, lunch one day. And I'm always looking for the purpose conversation. I don't care who it is. And uh, so I'm sitting there, and I was eating, and I think they were making some kind of uh, 
artwork out of their sandwiches. But I, I picked up the plate and I said to them, what is this for? And the five-year-old said, it's to, it's to hold your food. And I picked up a napkin. I said, what is this for? And little three-year-old, she said, it's for wiping your face. And I picked up the fork and I said, what is this for? And little Richard, the five-year-old said, it's for stabbing your food. And I looked at Richard and I said, what are you for? And he said, I'm for God. Which was incredible. And I said, well, what does God want you to do? And he said, love people. See, when I hear that, I don't hear, well, that's too simple. What I hear is that's powerful. I think that purpose, <clears throat> purpose must be simple in order to be lived out powerfully. But as soon as we complicate it, I think there's no answer. Yeah. Because complication produces complication, which produces complication. And you become like a, a 45 year old man in Chicago I talked to one time. And he said, and he's a great man with a great heart. But in terms of purpose, He's been trying to figure out where he belongs in life, what he's supposed to do. And here's what he said. I feel like my whole life I've been looking for a dot. Dot. A dot. Because the more you try to figure out the exactness of purpose, the exactness of where you belong, the target just gets smaller and further away. It's like being in a forest and deciding which leaf leaf you're supposed to pick. Like, how can you ever know? You, you can't ever know. And so, I, I simply put, I think that we overcomplicate what purpose is. And because of that, we live lives where we spend most of the time just contemplating and wondering to the point of mental exhaustion. And it's easier than just to, to avoid the topic. I, I can't know my purpose, so just don't talk about it with me. Well, we have so many ways to avoid today. I mean, in our jobs, in our, in our technology, in social media, but uh, such a great point. I love the simplicity, but also the, the, the complexity of what Little Richard had to say, right? Yeah. It's just to love people. Well, there's a lot of ways to do that on a daily basis, but if that's your purpose to get out there and, and do your, your daily work, your vocation, whatever it might be in a loving way to take care of your, your family and your community in a loving way, that really, man, that sure does simplify things, doesn't it? Yeah. And it, it allows for constant opportunity, constant opportunity. I'm working on a, a, a video course right now to help people overcome a, a, a hurdle that I think is so common, especially in mission-minded people. A mission-minded person is someone who feels like their life must make a difference. They can't just exist. They, they must be compelled by something. But there's a common question that people ask that I think becomes a massive hurdle, and it's this, what am I supposed to do? That question, to me, can't be answered whether it's what college am I supposed to go to? What house am I supposed to buy? What person am I supposed to marry? What job am I supposed to work? How do you, how do you ever know the answer to that question? I, I, though, although I think that question is a good moral question, if I'm approached with a business deal and all I need to do is be willing to cut, cut a couple corners, I should ask myself, hey, what am I supposed to do here? If some lady at the gym, I'm a married man, if some lady is flirting with me at the gym, which, by the way, doesn't happen, <laughs> um, I, I should think, uh, wait, what am I supposed to do here? But in yeah. terms of our choices, I think that question stifles us, and it can for years. And it's hard to enjoy your life when you're wondering, is this where I'm supposed to be working? How do you enjoy and take advantage of the opportunities that day when in your mind you're wondering if you're, if you're where you're supposed to be? Yeah, I think that goes back to what you were saying, that we get so stuck in our heads 
and, and contemplating and uh, navel gazing and just wondering <laughs> that in, in logo. Now that's a direct quote from Dr. Victor Frankl himself. I believe that comes in, in one of his books. He does mention navel gazing. Um, but you know, he tells us like, you have to take action. And that's where your idea, you know, purpose, freedom, and love, like, we are free to take action on a regular basis, on a daily basis, to make choices yeah. and do something about it. But we do get stuck just staring at the stars, staring at our own belly button, whatever it might be. And we don't take action. And then you sit there, as you said, and just getting to that point of, well, what am I supposed to do? At some point, stop wondering, just go do something. Yeah. How about just look down and see what's in front of your right or left foot and just do it. What's right in front of you? What is the chance right now? Be a, uh, I, 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 I'm a yes person now. There's a friend in my life that through some conversations, some of us men have, we've been challenging each other to stay in the adventure in life, do bold things. And so he decided to join this uh, trip with some friends climbing a mountain. Well, this guy, he's not in great shape, but he said yes. Well, then he he texted me last Friday and he said, hey, will you get up with me early tomorrow morning and climb the hill? There's this hill in Tulsa, Oklahoma. They call it the Mountain Man Hill. And it's where this group of men trained to climb mountains. It's a pretty steep hill on the side of an interstate. And I just said yes. And so it's Saturday in the morning, we're at 6 a.m. driving down the road to climb a hill. To me, and we and on that hill, we had the most amazing conversations. Mm -hmm. We talked about the Olympics and how and we, we talked about how the two of us are basically training for our Olympics. And the fact that in the Olympics that people are watching there's stadiums full of people and it's on television watching human beings compete for something together. I said, that's what you and I are doing. You and I are out here competing against this hill right now. It doesn't matter that there's not a crowd of people. The fact is you and I are no different than the Olympians. We are doing something with our life. We've given ourselves a challenge we're climbing this thing. And so, but that just, that just comes from taking action. Like just say yes to what's in front of you. And there's it becomes a snowball effect. Yeah. There's something very purposeful. I love that. Like just to say, yes, yes, I'll, <laughs> I'll do this. Yes. I'll, I'll, I'll take that trip. I'll visit those people. Um, I made a huge mistake a few weeks ago and I said yes to paragliding off a mountain. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Actually, I said yes several months ago, and then the check came due a few weeks ago uh, with some good friends. And it it was, uh, I'll tell you, Mark, I was couldn't sleep for days. I mean, literally, I was finding every excuse to say no. And uh, I, I got plenty of excuses. And at the end, I finally said yes. And I said yes one last time before my feet were 40, 50 feet off the ground. And eventually, I don't know, I'm not good with this kind of math, but several hundred, several thousand. I don't know. I was up there, Mark, and it was terrifying and it was exhilarating. And I'm still glad I said yes, but I may not do it again. It is far more important to have the courage and love mm. to take any step than to try to have the intelligence to figure out a specific step. I'll say that again, Mark. That's beautiful. It, One more time. It, it is far more important to have the courage and the love to take any step than to have the intelligence to figure out a specific step. Yeah. May, Daniel, maybe there aren't any specific steps at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe there aren't. Yeah. Maybe, maybe we are all farmers and we're living in dirt. And maybe our job every day is to rake the dirt and throw seeds. Mm -hmm. But not to not to hold a seed in our finger, one, and spend all day wondering where do I plant this? Where's the right portion of dirt on planet earth for me to throw this seed? When literally, I think, what if we live every day as if we have a thousand seeds to cast or 10,000 and the job is to just carry a little rake, maybe even have little spikes on the bottom of our shoes 
So wherever we walk, we just keep dropping seeds yeah. and just trust that good things come from it. I just, I, I, I'm in my, in my upbringing, I used to be a person that really over contemplated because I really cared. I really cared. The more you care, it feels right to be stuck with the question, what am I supposed to do? The problem is once you ask that question, you may never stop asking it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting that idea of having all those seeds. We actually, we do. And I, and I think I've shared this before. Um, the most recent estimate out of maybe Cornell University is we make somewhere around 20,000 decisions every day. Mm. Every day, 20,000 from what we're going to wear to what we're going to eat to who we're going to impact to what lane we're going to drive in and all those other things. But if you just used a small 10% of the 5% of those to sow a seed, to share some wisdom, to share some purpose, some freedom, some love with somebody else, what, are, what an amazing purposeful mm impact somebody could have yeah i love yeah. that and in your analogy right your metaphor of what if we also had the equipment to do that what if we wore the right shoes on a daily basis so that we could you know continue to sow seeds you know what if we went into our day with with this attitude of purposefulness and and these mm. attitudes of freedom and love and oh okay so you went from teaching 14 year olds which is by no means an easy task <laughs> Uh, so I, I certainly respect you for that. I know there's a, a lot of teachers in the audience that uh, would appreciate that too. But purpose, freedom, and love, 20 years in teaching 14-year-olds. How do you share this message? To, are, are you still teaching 14-year-olds today? No. No. I mean, I will. Like, uh, I do have a local school that asked me to come once a month and talk about mental health. Mm. And so there's teenagers of various ages that I go and talk to there about mental health. But I'm not, I don't, I'm not in a classroom these days. So then what is your purpose in sharing purpose? How do you get the message out there? Uh, any way I can, I, 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 I apply it very personally in my life, first of all, because I believe anything we have in our life that we want to share with others must first of all be shared in the mirror, lived out in the mirror and shared with us, cl those closest to us. So my most uh, immediately, I'm going to live out my life in front of my my adult kids, my grandkids, my wife. Um, where do I do this? Last night, I was asked to go to a men's group and lead a discussion, and I did that. Um, there are some businesses that have that come and have us lead our program with their people, just helping them know their purpose. Um, we help people a lot with um, marriage problems or depression problems or addiction problems because the answer is always the same your problem isn't your problem it's that you're not living the life you are made for and so basically it, the topic of purpose the, one, the thing that really surprised me when i started this journey was it's like i, I saw something i couldn't unsee as a man as a man who used to live kind of caged up as a man, I, I realized that people could have freedom and chase their purpose, which is basically what happened in my life. Because so many years I was living my life, and although I was a good man, I felt like I lived in a prison, and people came to see me at visiting hours for me to teach them. But the one thing I could never teach was freedom. So when I found freedom as a person... And, and freedom didn't come by fixing myself. I had to realize, I came to realize I didn't have to fix my problem. I could leave this prison because the door's unlocked and I can go chase my purpose. And then I looked around and realized, oh my, people everywhere are living in the prison of their thinking. They're not imprisoned by their problem. They're imprisoned by how they think about their problem. And the reason they think about their problems is because they don't have anything greater to think about. I think about all the years that I spent and my most compelling thought about me is I need to lose weight. 
At one point, I weighed almost 400 pounds. And to wake up every day and think, I need to lose weight. That thinking is what created the prison. That thinking. It wasn't that I gained weight physically. It's that the physical weight caused me to have a mental weight that stunted me, stifled me, imprisoned me. And as I looked around, I was like, I saw it everywhere I looked. I saw the alcoholic and I was like, wait, he's trying to stop drinking. That's no purpose. No, nobody can wake up with the goal of, of stopping drinking and stop drinking. Nobody can wake up with the goal of stop eating too much and stop eating too much. Nobody can wake up and say, I need to stop gambling and somehow stop gambling and just fill in the blank. Like every human problem is like, and I started to look around and realize that at the core, everyone's story is basically the same. We, because we're human, we, we stumble into problems. And then the way we think about those problems puts us in a cage and all of our focus becomes to fix the problem or fix ourselves. And it makes us very self-focused. Mm -hmm. When we focus on our problem, we're focusing on ourself. And that is the problem. Mark, have and you so been studying logotherapy? Because this sounds very familiar. And I know you and I had a chat about this, but that is right out of the work that I do. I agree with you wholeheartedly. Um, I've been doing addictions treatment for 20, 25 years now. And I was trained in the classic way. Right. Like, you know, yeah. you, you need to turn your will and your power over and and then you should never drink again. And uh, that's hard. But, you know, when I started yeah. looking at different ways to do it, when I started looking at logotherapy and Victor Frankl and, and realizing now if we can find some meaning and purpose and then support it with resilience, all of a sudden these these men I was working with, they said, yeah, if I if I focus on my family or or I may not like my job and that causes me to drink sometimes. But if I have this side project, this thing I'm doing, for some guys, I remember one guy is like, man, I really want a food truck. And he started working on that, and that was the thing that kept him going. Another guy loves small engine repair. He was repairing like five or ten lawnmowers a day. But he's like, yeah, it's hard to repair a lawnmower when you're drunk. And uh, he's like, yeah, that, that keeps me going. I, I, maybe not. I don't know. Maybe you can repair it, but it's not going to work real well. Um, but, that, I mean, that is very – What's that? Might become a weed eater. <laughs> it could be. But that is so consistent with what you're saying. You can't wake up in the morning and be like, I am not going to do this. But instead, and that's something I've shared with other people working on uh, on physical fitness and health and, and weight is it's really hard to say, I don't want to eat that. I don't want to uh, for, for people that want to quit smoking. But if you have a different goal, a goal that's not consistent with eating Twinkies and cake, right? But like, man, I want to get to that finish line. I want to run that 5K, that half marathon. I want to bike 100 miles, whatever it might. It doesn't have to be 100. It could be two miles, right? Everybody's marathon has to start somewhere, whether that's, you know, 100 yards or 100 miles. Yeah. What did uh, it for I, you? Uh, you know, it's funny. I always really loved people. I think that in my whole life, all I ever wanted to do was help people. But the more that I gazed at my problem with food and weight, I felt it disqualified me. I, I can't matter with people, was look at me. And the more I focused on my problem, the less I was capable of just boldly loving people. And and I guess I guess that was it for me. It was just I I left teaching because after a couple of years of just wrestling, was I felt like as a man. All I saw myself doing as a man was descending. Inside of me, the the heart I had to really live, the, the desire I had to really make a difference, it was getting smaller and smaller as my comfort and security was gr growing greater and greater. And I just, but I saw the descent. I saw, I could feel as a man what I was becoming as I was no longer chasing something. And, and I was kind of, I could feel myself giving up on even caring about losing weight 
which would cause me to just more and more indulge in the numbing pattern of just, just eat away the wrestling. Just eat to numb that wrestling. And it was in this time of wrestling, I was reading a book one time, and I'll never forget it. It was probably seven years ago. The first line of the book said, stop living as if the goal of life is to arrive at death safely. And I read that first line again, and I was at the gym on the treadmill, walking very slowly. I handed it to my wife and I said, read that first sentence. And I told her, I'm, I'm leaving. I'm leaving the school. It's my last year. And I, I didn't know what I was going to go into, but I knew I had to get out of this prison where all I had to live for every day was a little dose of comfort, a little dose of reputation, and the security of a paycheck. But in that prison, I was just dying. I'll, I'll never, I'll never forget the day that I. The hardest thing for I think every human to do is just to be honest about oneself. And I think it's the pathway to freedom. I finally reached out to a man. I didn't know him. I just knew of him. And I told him, I said, I said, Alan, I feel like I'm going to die a young man. I'm just, as a man, all I saw myself as was an overweight, underachieving man. And I said, I'm going to die young because of it. And I told Alan, I said, I'm, I'm imagining my funeral. There's going to be all these people there because a lot of people know me because I'm a teacher. And they're all going to be, they're going to sit there thinking, well, wow, Mark, Mark was a good guy. If he would have stopped eating biscuits, maybe he could have done something with his life. And worst of all, I said, Alan, my, my three kids on the front row, they're, they're human just like me. And my life would have never shown them what freedom looks like. But in that moment, I don't think Alan realized how much of a logotherapy kind of thing he did. But in that moment, what many people would do is say, well, Mark, so let's talk about which food compels you the most. Which food do we need to somehow eliminate? Mark, how much do you exercise? He could have started down a road of the tips and tricks to not eating too much and losing weight. And can I tell you something? That would have not helped at all. When you have a problem and you hate it for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, and you try all these things and you're thinking all these thoughts and I got to lose weight, got to lose weight, got to lose weight. And someone else comes along and says, you need to lose weight. Oh, really? Is, is that what it is? Newsflash, yeah. But he said something to me that changed my life. And I think it's logotherapy. He said, what's it holding you back from? It's as if, it's as if he picked up a book that was my purpose and it was dusted over with years of my dusty thinking. And it's as if he swiped it off. And he said, What's it holding you back from? He didn't ask me about food and exercise. He asked me, he asked me a question to compel me to look at a far different thing. Who, and this is why I love to ask people this, when people come to me with their problems, I don't, I don't mention their problem. Maybe, maybe down the road I do, but I begin with this question. Jarrett, who were you made to be? Because that's all that matters. What if you start chasing the person you were made to be? Well, I think that's a question we don't ask ourselves enough. No. Right? As, as I was saying, we get stuck in the in the rut of the day-to-day. -day. And, and maybe maybe the day-to-day the -day is rewarding. 
but I, I want to ask you to, to you, you told me an amazing story uh, last week when we were chatting, right? You told me the Eagle story. Yeah. Can you tell that? I, because I think, well, I don't want to give it away. Can you tell the Eagle story and what that I, meant to you? In, it was in that two years of wrestling before I finally left teaching. I was just wrestling with everything about my life and my sense of calling. I felt like the room I was teaching in was shrinking. There was something very tiny. It's like there was a one inch tall lion living at the bottom of my heart under a blanket. And occasionally he would wiggle his tail. And, but I gave him no reason to roar. It's as if that little lion inside me was like, oh, there's Mark. He's excited. What's he excited about? Oh, an oatmeal cream pie. I don't have to wake up for that. So I think it was the last year or the second to last year of teaching. I was on this field trip. And we went to a zoo. I was a chaperone and I came across this enclosure that was about like a very large living room with a tall ceiling. And there was a tree right in the middle that spread out and filled most of the space. And I didn't see anything. So I did what I hate to do, which is read something. Especially at the zoo. I just want to see animals moving and eating and growling and all that fun stuff. And I went to the placard and it said there was some kind of eagle in this cage. And immediately I was like, wait, there's no room in here. There's no room. There's no space. And so I find this eagle on this branch. And I feel like I, I spent months talking to that eagle in my mind, thinking about its life. And it's comfortable. It's safe. They come and feed it food. No one's allowed to hunt. And every now and then someone stops and says, look, mom, it's an eagle. Isn't that cool? And I felt like, I felt like I was that eagle. I felt like we were living the same life. I was comfortable, secure. And every now and then somebody would say, oh, there's Mr. Delaney. He's a, he's a fun teacher, you know, a, a great, you know, but I'm in that cage. And there's one question that I had to ask the eagle in my imaginary conversation that I didn't want to ask myself, but the question that I that I wondered was, what's it like to be an eagle and never use your wings? What's it like to live a life where you never need to use this wonderful gift that you have, the superpower you have? And I felt like I was living a life where I never needed to use my wings. And now life, I just was talking to my wife and we, we exchanged a, a, a more secure life financially for an adventurous life financially. But we, there's no way we could trade it because we've exchanged a life seeking comfort for a life living out purpose. And it's wrapped up in every day. The comfort, the reward of comfort is like, it's like dust. It just doesn't do anything. But the reward of meaningful living, it just goes on and on and on and on. So I will, so the thing I had to do as a human is I had to leave that cage I was in. But I, but it takes it takes purpose to do that, yeah. because otherwise, why would comfort is just always easy. Purpose is just a ten is just ten thousand times better. And so I just left the cage. Love that story, and I think, I, I think many of us feel we might be stuck in some kind of cage. I know you speak on relationships and toxicity there and. Are we stuck in a relationship cage that we need to to work on or, or is it a career cage or just like an entire life cage? And yeah. it's interesting. I, I think I've, I've seen this and read this in so many ways and so many different uh, descriptions, but I was just reading again this morning, a great book called The Happiness Hypothesis. Mm. Um and you know, next time you're on the treadmill, I know you're not a big fan of reading, but maybe listen to it. It's <laughs> it's, it's a lot about uh, it's some good ancient wisdom about the the science of happiness. But one of the things it was saying, and I'm going to mangle this really well, but um, it's those it's the oatmeal cream pies, 
right? The little niceties, the little comforts that are okay once in a while through our day. Yeah. Whether it's a cup of coffee in the morning or a little bit of ice cream at night. But it's those things that we that challenge us, that give us an opportunity to grow, that teach us, that train us, that force us to evolve. The more we have of those in our day, whether it's creating something, right? Art, music, learning something, or helping somebody else, those are the things that give us purpose, that give us meaning, that keep yeah. moving us forward and prevent us from feeling stuck, prevent us from feeling trapped in those cages. Yeah. Yeah, I think this is the good news. That The bad news is I think most people live in a prison of their own life. The good news is it's not hard to leave it. Yeah. It's it's simple. The longer we live in a prison, I, I was talking to a man last night, when you when you're a prisoner, you act like a prisoner. You begin to think like a prisoner. And the problems get accumulated. For many people, it's just one massive problem that accumulates. The, for many people, our society compels people in a prison to fix their problem. What people need is to leave the prison. <laughs> And that's the good news is like I I felt like when I when I realized that what I needed was freedom, not the loss of weight. I needed freedom. And freedom was the walking out of that prison of how I thought about my problem, how I thought about me. I gained I, I lost a hundred pounds above my shoulders in mere moments. Just moments. And now I told the guys last night at this meeting, I said, listen, guys, you're not looking at a skinny man right now, but you are completely looking at a man who is completely free because I will never again look at my life and wonder, am I skinny enough? Every day, I pay attention to what I would call my kryptonite because every Superman has kryptonite. Everyone has kryptonite. I don't, I don't say it doesn't matter. I know it's there and I'm honest about it, but I do not focus on avoiding kryptonite. I focus on pursuing purpose every day. And I acknowledge kryptonite whenever it pops up. Many people get it backwards we're in that prison and outside of the prison bars is purpose that we could have, but I have to get rid of my kryptonite first. And it's like, we will never live. You will never, ever live. If you're trying to remove the kryptonite from your life, you will never wear the cape. But if you wear your cape, you can live away from your kryptonite. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's such a powerful statement, right? It's not about, you know, we've talked about moving or, or leaving or finding freedom, right? But that doesn't always mean leaving a job or leaving a relationship. What you said is mm. so amazing. Sometimes it just means changing the way you see it, changing the way you see yourself in that job, in that relationship, and then realizing like, where do I find my purpose? Where do I find my meaning? And, and how do yeah. I do that on a daily basis? Yeah, yeah, totally. It, it, it's so, it is so, it can be so easy for people. I'll, I'll tell this story about a, a young man. He was 32 years old. His dad sent him my way and he had began to drink alcohol, uh, a lot of alcohol. He'd been to the hospital at least once because of some kind of episode with alcohol. And everyone's worried about what? His alcohol consumption. When he showed up for our first meeting, he simply looked at me and said, I don't know how I got here. Now, my conversation never went to alcohol. We met, I think, five times, never went to alcohol. And in our conversation, I, I just started drawing a picture of what I believe happens in people's lives. It was, I think, I think the storyline of our lives is pretty much the same. Is we have a heart with good intentions and we have dreams and things we really want in life. And at some point, 
at some point things happen in life and we end up in this whole different place. And then it, it, it's as if we're, it's as if life is a treasure hunt and I'm walking on the, on a path in a wilderness and I'm on a treasure hunt and that path can be hard because it's got ups and downs and it rains sometimes or it gets cold, but but Daniel, I'm on a treasure hunt. Don't you see it? I'm on a treasure hunt. It doesn't matter that it's hard. I'm hunting for treasure. But let's say at some point I wander off that path for some reason. And I end up getting trapped in, in the, a bear trap. It grabs a hold of my leg and I'm I'm just stuck in the space. And I can't go, but I can't crawl, but like two feet in every direction. I, I can't do my treasure hunt. And the pain, the pain of emptiness just fills my life. And then someone comes and they care about my pain and they drop off uh, some alcohol for me, let's say. Well, while I'm living there, plastered to the ground because of this bear trap, and I can't move or live, am I going to drink the alcohol? I must drink the alcohol. Right. There is no choice. Because the, the greatest pain in life is not the presence of a problem. The greatest pain in life is the absence of what life was made for. And if my heart can't be in pursuit of the treasure, and I now believe that I am just stuck on this small plot of ground where there's nothing for me here, how do I not drink? So, but, so oftentimes people show up and talk to a person like that. And we don't see the bear trap. We only see the empty cans. And we tell them to stop drinking. What we need to do is to help them to start living. So I drew this picture for Jared. And I asked him about his life and Basically, ages 16 to 30, here's what he was doing with most of his time. He was a baseball player and a football player in high school, and in college, a little bit of baseball. While he was in high school, he was being trained to be a hunting guide, and so he spent some time working for a hunting guide. He's helping people fish and hunt. He went to college and got a fishing and, and wildlife degree, started a business as a hunting guide. So ages 16 to 30... His life was jam-packed with adventure, with people, with the purpose of helping people catch something. So much Hunt adventure, something. so much connection. That had been amazing. Yeah. Purpose, connection, people. Incredible. And then at age 30, because now he has a wife and a couple of kids and the, the hunting guide business takes so much time, he decides I should sell this. And just go get this job close to my house in a corporate office with no windows. His co-workers, there's zero connection with them. He says, I work 12-hour days, three or four days a week. And he says, every time I go in, I say, well, here comes 12 hours of wasted life. So he went to a, from a life of adventure, connection with people, purpose, to a life with no connection with people, no seeming purpose, and he wonders why he's drinking? The question is, how are you not also doing drugs? Like, you, you had so much meaning and connection, and now you have none? Like, this is a desperate situation. The desperate situation is not the presence of alcohol. The desperate situation is the absence of meaning and connection. So alcohol is but a symptom of what's so, going on on a deeper level. But we yeah. keep telling people in our society, we keep telling that broken person, we keep telling them to stop drinking, and they can't. So Jarrett, he made a couple shifts in his life. He had a a good friend a couple hours away that used to just love hunting together. And he put it on his calendar that every month he's going to go and, and spend a couple days with that friend hunting. He also had this vision 
for this um, type of, of hunting gear he could create on his own in his garage. It would take some time. All of his spare time, he's in his garage creating this invention for hunting that he wants to begin to sell. Well, he he didn't stop drinking. He started living, which caused him to stop drinking. But the goal wasn't to stop drinking. The goal was to live again. And this is the message, I believe, of logotherapy, though I've not studied it much, but I heard about it one time and it changed my life. Right. Like when I heard about Viktor Frankl's core thinking on helping people, I was immediately like, yes, that is exactly what people need. There isn't anything beyond that. I am not going to study all the therapies. This is what people need. I'm going to spend the rest of my life coming across broken people, and I'm going to ask them, who are you made to be? What is your purpose? Let's go focus on something bigger than your problem. And so that's the, that, that's my thoughts on, on purpose and helping broken people. And you know what's exciting to me? I think that common people can offer logotherapy to all kinds of people. Absolutely. Because there's so many hurting people. There's only so many therapists. Mm -hmm. some are good mm -hmm. and some are not good right. right and so many people need help and i think that common people everywhere can be equipped to do logo therapy with common people everywhere and that really excites me yeah there's a very brief list of, of basic ideas but it comes down to a lot of the work that you're doing helping people find that meaning and purpose asking those important questions who were you meant to be and, well, and you know Mark, I got to tell you, you're an amazing storyteller. I could sit here and listen to your stories all day, but I know you got people to go help <laughs> and I've got people to go help. And then and, and I also want to point out if, if you like Mark's stories as I do, you got to check out one step to freedom, his new book out there, where one of my favorite stories is how he, uh, went from Muncie, Indiana to Mishawaka, Indiana, and now Tulsa, Oklahoma. That's a story close to, uh, <laughs> my Hoosier heart and many of the listeners out there, fellow Hoosiers. So, um, and Mark, how, how can people find out more about you? How can they connect with you if they want to work with your amazing style of helping people find purpose? They can go to my website, Mark, um, Mark Delaney uh, They can email me Mark at Mark Delaney dot me. Um, I also have a podcast called the purpose mastermind podcast, which you're going to be on in, uh, hopefully a couple of weeks, very hopefully soon. Hopefully you're soon. Absolutely. Uh, so yeah, yeah, that's how you can find me. So after you're done listening to the Meaning Project podcast, go check out Mark's podcast. We'll have all the links in the show notes. And uh, yeah, it sounds like you can hear me in a couple of weeks. And again, Mark's stories, uh, the, the story of Little Richard just, I mean, warmed my heart. But then also I saw some great uh, some great podcasts on difficulties in marriage and how to heal from that. So some great stuff out there. Go check out Mark's website. And uh, Mark, thank you so much. That was cool, man. I tell you what. For for those of you listening, you know I'm taking a break, and Mark was instrumental in resurrecting this podcast because there was a part of me going, man, that break was nice, but I got to have this chat with Mark last week, and I was like, that was so much more meaningful than taking a break. So, Mark, thank you for uh, reinvigorating my love for podcasting and chatting with other people, and uh, hopefully, you know, people appreciate your message and, and your stories. And uh, go check out One Step to Freedom by Mark Delaney. And check out his website. And once again, thank you for giving me this opportunity to bring a little mental health and meaning to your day. Take care.